all agree on the pathway to get there, it gives us a universal definition and foundation to start with. So we have, uh, especially SDG number 12 about, um, you know, the impact of production and, and what, what that, uh, making that right within supply chain environments would do to um, help the fashion industry and, and help the planet overall. So I, I just think that um, understanding and getting the knowledge out there about what the, the place to start is, which is uh, understanding what the SDGs, unpacking them, and then how can those be implemented into various different business environments. Uh, Camila. Yeah. <laughs> Misha, did you want to interject on that? You're on mute. Can you, are you able to unmute? Yes, there you go. Sorry, my <laughs> laptop's getting frozen. Um, so in my opinion, there's very few sustainable development goals that are not and that fashion does not impact or the artisan industry or whatever it is, there's only like maybe one that I can think of, but of the 17, I think there's at least 16 that are impacted by, like if you look at where everything from raw material to delivery to the customer, um, it's gonna, all of those things are affect, all of those things affect the sustainable, develop, um, sustainable development goals. Um, one thing that I often like to say, and I like to bring into these conversations from the beginning, we have to always remember um, how the fashion industry was started. And, you know, that was started um, basically with uh, slavery. So you have colonialization, you have slavery, you have shadow slavery in the U.S. And you have um, the, the theft of indigenous land and here in North America to prop up the modern fashion industry in the 19th century and export to Europe and every world. And in that, killing the environment by using a monocrop. So I'm just going to use the example of cotton. And I use that example because I am a descendant of um, Africans who were stolen from the continent, brought to the U.S. and forced to work on plantations here, on cotton plantations specifically in Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, and then made to prop up this fashion industry. Um, and so now I don't think even though like legal slavery has ended, I don't think we've actually, I don't think it's stopped. So now we have the issues of um, over, you know, the fashion industry, fashion industry still promotes overconsumption. Um, the leadership at the top lacks representation and inclusion. Um, fashion appropriates designs from indigenous cultures around the world. It, you know, contributes to climate change. It dumps its waste in the global south, and it continues to devalue labor through exploited, um, exploitative labor practices um, as it outsources to countries and communities with less labor laws and environmental regulations. Yeah, Jacqueline, did you want to interject on that question? Um, yeah, I think uh, both Bettina and, and Tamisha both kind of covered very good angles of it. I would say also that the situation right now in fashion is that especially in light of the environment that we're in, as in pandemic, um, has really proved that the industry is broken. Um, and because for those who are in denial, we can truly see that the way it's been set up um, isn't working, hasn't worked. Um, we know about the history, as Tamitra said, how it's been it was started. And the reality is showing that we can't keep going with an archaic system into a future um, kind of world that we are moving into, um, a smart world. So things have to change. Um, the impact is being shown even worse. It's, it's been highlighted, you know, even from 2013 with the Rana Plaza factory class, we've seen that, but even more in the last year, we've seen how it's had a lot of negative impact. And we all must, um, you know, admit our responsibilities as well. And you know, I was a fashion designer for nearly 20 years. So as part of the problem, you know, I do help people start fashion businesses. I could admittedly say that is part of the problem. Um, you know, things. So I think my internet is going out. Hopefully you can still hear me. It, it paused for a second, but you're back. 
Okay. Yeah. So how you are paused again, Jacqueline. <laughs> Perhaps um, maybe turn off your video and see if your sound can at least come through. Uh, while she's while she's getting her connection, because I know she was <laughs> she was saying some really good things. Um, yeah, so so I think all of you kind of touched on a little bit about the social implications, um, some of the social injustices that happen in the fashion industry. Um, you mentioned about you know, all of these clothes going into landfills into the global south. Um, and so that that's one thing, like a lot of our clothes, we do not even wear them, you know, they, we give them away, or we throw them away. And these clothes go to uh, the global south, they go to other countries, they impact uh, the economy there. And they also were basically throwing all of our trash there and it goes into their landfills and then affects them environmentally. So that's a great point. And then um, I also think, I, I think um, Jacqueline was kind of getting into this too. She was talking about the garment makers and what happened with uh, Rana Plaza and how a lot of the conditions for the garment makers are subpar. You know, they get paid an equivalent of $2 an hour. Uh, which they can't go home and they can't, they don't make a living wage and they don't, they're not able to um, feed their families and they work in such dire conditions. And uh, Jacqueline was referring to the collapse, the factory collapse at Rana Plaza, which a lot of, you know, this has happened, these factory collapses, you know, things like that has, have happened, you know, globally. And so, you know, it's, it's, not great working conditions and a whole bunch of other, you know, social issues that happen. And I think that goes back to what Misha was saying about just how the fashion industry was built, right? It was built on the labor, the unpaid or the low paid labor of black and brown people. Like that's how the system continues today. <laughs> yeah, well talk about that. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. sure. Uh, when, when Misha was saying that, it just brought uh, to mind so many um, issues. If we look at some of the um, mobilization around the pay up campaign, as an example, and canceled orders uh, during the COVID pandemic in the early days, um, that's pretty standard. I know in my production experience for the various different companies that if uh, ordering from suppliers um, in different parts of Asia, Africa as well, South America, that you'll see that you'll order something from uh, one of these vendors and they immediately start to produce it. And it, there's like a purchase order system where they're depending on me uh, or my company to pay for that item. And a lot of times, um, those orders were canceled um, from various different large scale retailers. So um, there's not only are the climate impacts being felt by those marginalized communities around the world, but also the impacts of um, large scale companies not paying for things that they've ordered. Uh, the materials have already been consumed or used uh, to produce the, the items that we don't necessarily need, but uh, have ordered on large scale. So the system of pushing things out um, to the customer and uh, putting them in brick and mortar stores are also outdated. And it is based on the fact that the total cost of making something isn't being reflected in the pricing for clothing that we produce. So there's that cheap labor that has to exist for this current model, which really needs to be shaken up. And I think COVID has really pushed for that to say, we can't have these horrible conditions where people aren't being paid fairly and um, not being paid at all in some cases, because this is forcing them into starvation and 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 we, we just can't have that happen. And, and what can we do to change that? Um, that being smaller brands actually buying what we need. Um, us as consumers not, not pushing to have something be $5 when it's not fair for the person who made it. Um, it took them more than that labor-wise. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if the shirt is five dollars, who, who is pay, you know who who on the end, other end doesn't you know get the right pay? And Jacqueline, I see your back. <laughs> um, I would love for you to finish your thought on this. Um, no, I think my internet is just a bit off. We've had some stormy weather, but um, yeah, it was just a quick one to kind of add on to Bettina before you go into the next point is that with this industry, we have to remember last year, as much as we saw that that happened, things happen in industry, we also saw a flip side with the highest record of e-commerce. Um, there was a huge growth of for obvious reasons. And um, within that, there was a lot of these fast fashion retailers, I don't think I even have to name them, who were, especially around Black Friday, selling products for eight pence. I mean, you know, you could say they were getting rid of product they couldn't sell before. You could say that to help to justify it, but it's putting into consumers a mindset of, you know, high consumerism, they don't, things they don't need and just purchasing it because it's low, because it's cheap, because it's, it's a, you know, a price that is affordable for them or more than affordable. So there was also a mindset that's, that's actually been created in during this period over the last year that also should be um, noted within what's happening in fashion. Thank you. Yeah, that's such a good point because if, if something is so cheap, it's like, like it's cheaper to buy fashion than it is food sometimes. So it's like, you know, why wouldn't, you know, it makes it so it's, you can just throw it away and not feel bad about it, right? Um, so I love it that everyone kind of went into the social issues of fashion. And there's a ton of environmental impacts that fashion has, right? Like the dyes that go into the water when we, all the water that it takes up. Uh, Misha, you touched on like some of the agriculture things that go on with fashion. So, I mean, it just spans the gamut. Um, but one of the things, you know, we talked about, you know, the bad stuff about the fashion industry, but I would love for us to talk a little bit about the effect that fashion has on um, culture, because I think that fashion is integrated into a lot of cultures, especially like black and brown cultures and you know everyone wears clothes right so and i even i even see fashion cross and we'll probably talk about this a little bit we but i even see fashion crossing over to people like gamers that wouldn't normally uh, you know they say they're not into fashion but they definitely dress their avatars you know um and so i would love to throw this question um to jacqueline because i know that you work you know largely um, in Africa and you have you actually wrote a book on this right <laughs> about how how you know fashion is kind of integrated into culture so if you could just you know touch on that because I think fashion is very influential globally yeah I mean there's fashion there's style there's dress there's a uh, different topics of um, how we clothe ourselves and you know, what we're trying to portray by you know, by what we wear, is it comfort? Is it for need? Is it because of the work we're in? So, and then when it comes to culture, there's a lot. I mean, this can go, <laughs> this could open up a can of worms, really, in this discussion. But there is obviously issues around cultural appropriation. Um, I mean, obviously, I work with Africa, so we do see a lot of this. Um, um, but I know in many, many cultures around the world. Um, and um, cultural groups that we're seeing that you know take people taking advantage of their um, traditional way and putting on catwalks and so forth. But um, I'm, getting, I'm sure you can go into all of that another part, another time. But just looking just how the importance of of clothing and heritage is something that I've been looking at myself in personal research um, in just the importance of it keeping traditions alive. And I found that especially working with Africa, there's so so many so many countries so many cultural groups so much traditions so much languages so much of everything and when it comes to clothing or cloth or the story of textiles um it's something that is is embedded in history it really is embedded in in history and in some ways i wanted to preserve you know my well no, the part that i saw because there's an importance of um documentation of information that has been lost, especially with you know the African story. Um, being I'm, I'm British born of Jamaican heritage, um, I've got family members who came from a group of people called the Maroon tribe, who were known as runaway slaves um, 
um, throughout the Caribbean, Haiti, you know, in Jamaica, where my, my family are from. And they, you know, they would bring back some of the traditions through, um, you know, they were enslaved um, people, enslaved Africans. They, they would bring some of their heritage from their culture. And unless we document things, before it was oral, but unless we document things, that things can be lost. And so with the work that I'm doing, um, the blog, with the books, everything is about documenting these histories, these stories, these through the cloth and the importance of this um, and doing it with the people. Cause I don't know, I'm just, I'm not directly of these heritages where these cloths are made. So I wasn't there when they were created. So I need to speak with the people who come from the direct lineage to learn. And I think, yeah, it's really important that we do so. Yeah, I mean, fashion is so integrated in culture. Yeah. It really is, you know, and it affects people globally. Um, so I will say like, you're absolutely right. All these different questions, we could have a whole, you know, session about them, like a, a whole conference on each of these questions. Um, so I absolutely love that everyone is putting resources in the chat. Keep doing that because I'm sure there's going to be some people on the call that would like to dig in further. So thank you, um, everyone, for putting resources in the chat. Um, so if I may say something, Camille. Yes. Um, in, re in regards to fashion and culture, there's such a mashup. Like if we look at um, fashion uh, intersex, fashion is a subset of, I don't even want to say it's a subset of culture. It almost is a, the, an equivalent. It's such an expression. Um, we see things uh, to where fashion, like you mentioned, has crossed into gamification. Um, where, you know, you can dress your avatars. I think Gucci just sold some shoes where um, you can't even buy them uh, to, to wear, but you can buy them digitally to, to put on pictures and things like that for social media and, and other places. But then you even see kind of cross collaborations with, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton doing something with the NBA and, and other, um, a sporting uh, type of events. So you see that sponsorship and that cross collaboration. And I, I think uh, fashion is a way for people to express themselves. It, it, it's such an important part of culture that it, it, it almost is culture. So um, when you have something that does, that touches so many parts of everyone's lives, how they represent themselves and um, whether it's traditional indigenous garments or something that we uh, just toss away, that that line uh, really, as, as things get to be cheaper, I think that's when it becomes to where it's not culture, right? So we, we've made something a commodity. So I, I, I just wanted to say that it's, there's just so much of a uh, interweaving of uh, what, what we clothe ourselves in represents a little bit of who we are um, that, when it's something that's of a, a lower quality or cheaper uh, garment, then that, that takes that away, that, that uh, appreciation of artisanship and, and things like that. It just, it, it, like you said, it, we could be here for days to talk about that, but it's just that crisscross. It's, I think it's so important. I think a lot of times people think it's just clothes, but it's so much more. I love, I love that point because I mean, if you think about, and I think that's why probably all of us are really excited about working in this space because we know that even though there's a lot going on that may be negative, we know that fashion has the power because it's so integrated um, to, to impact the world positively. Um, to, uh, Misha, I don't know if you had any, any, anything you wanted to comment on that. Um, yes, so I think you all covered most of it, but I think one of the important things to think about, specifically in terms of cultural appropriation, and um, this is probably an unpopular opinion also, um, I think we put too much of the blame on fast fashion. Luxury fashion can also appropriate, and it does appropriate a lot from artisan culture. Um, and sometimes even if we want to look at um, Virgil Abloh and um, what was done with Kente cloth recently, um, or Lim Lim and H&M, there's, I think there's a very fine line, um, 
but you also have like um Zen Yumu, I can never say it right, what they did with Kenyan artisans and they actually tell the story of like this is woven this way. Um I think we're at risk of losing some of those cultures. Um, due to the pandemic and people not being able to actually produce their craft. So I have artisans who, you know, right now they've chosen to work in other um, areas, whether that's agriculture or anything else right now, because a lot of the artisan industry relies on tourism. And so if people aren't traveling in, they're not able to sell, they're not able to feed their families. Um, you know, China's, China, India, Bangladesh, whatever is producing the same you know, replicas of their garments is continuing to kill the industry. So I think we're we're at a key time in a place where we might be losing some of those cultures if we don't start to shift back to um, less production and better artisan and designer partnerships. Yeah, that's that's such an important point. Um, so when we think about system change. Um, we want to get down to the root of the problem. And I feel like we kind of touched on, touched on this because I know every one of the panelists has, you know, they live and breathe this. They've been thinking about this, you know, like what is the root of the problem? And so I would like to go into that a little bit and talk about, okay, you know, you mentioned fast fashion, you mentioned overconsumption, we mentioned the environmental and the social issues. Why is this happening? Um, and anyone can start on that. Um, I'll start with that. So one of the big reasons is um, governance, right? So I think, like, hey, I think there's all these agreements that were signed after Rana Plaza that are cool on the surface, but they actually don't really make any kind of impact. And so it's one thing to sign an agreement and not source from certain suppliers, but if you don't um, follow up with them, it's kind of pointless. Um, and on top of that, you have campaigns like um, pay up fashion, right? And I think we're putting a lot of pressure on like, I don't think, I think we should apply pressure to all brands, but I think we're not applying enough pressure to governance. So it, it needs to be like multi-stakeholder approaches and how we um, do this and I think a lot of the reason is also because we're not listening to worker led movement. So we have workers in Myanmar, we have workers in Bangladesh, we have workers in LA who are specifically organized and saying, hey, this is what needs to happen for us to be able to meet our livelihood. These are the conditions we're going through. And fashion in terms of governance is not taking those workers into to the workers' desires into the court. It's all about um, lobbying with corporate. All right, and so I think there needs to be more collective bargaining agreements because um, there's a lot of causes that like, I think it's called force majeure where you can, we saw that with the pandemic where, you know, you have clothes in production already and you have fabric that have been bought and then you can all of a sudden just get out of your contract. So those kind of things should not be legal. And that's where you need the governance to, to do that or finding a better way to, what are some of those terms that need to be re looked at? Absolutely. And I'm going to go deeper and I'm going to ask, so why are these fashion industry brands, why don't they listen to the garment makers? Why don't they listen? Why don't they follow these different regulations? If I could will, add, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tamisha. One quick, quick thing. I think it's mostly because um, profit is prioritized over people and the environment. I definitely would agree with that. And I would say that we have to look at the makeup of some of these executive and C-suites of brands and uh, to be a bit, uh, we've seen a lot of from last summer, solidarity with um, certain social movements and uh, brands putting black squares on their social media as an example, saying they're in solidarity, yet they're mistreating their workers. Um, we, we see movements on um, how can we use less water and organic fibers, but the plight of workers are, are left behind. So I think it's because their representation in uh, leadership roles does not reflect the diverse makeup of of the world. We don't have enough 
um, indigenous people of color, um, just even different viewpoints in, in places that can make decisions so that we don't see things going down the runway with people in straight jackets and not uh, being insensitive to mental health or um, not understanding what diversity really means and just kind of using it as a buzzword. Um, I think the heart of it is that the leadership representation is, is very skewed and very monolithic. Yeah, oh. okay. Hey, <laughs> I'm going to add on. I'm so glad you said that. I remember going to, you know, part of my journey has been I, I initially just attended as many events as I could on sustainable fashion, on the industry, and so forth to understand more. Um, because I, I learned fashion design, I didn't learn, you know, sustain, sustainability from that good beginning. That's why I went and did that degree in the end. But I went to so many events and I would always see on the stages and I would complain to some of the, well, not. I would uh, diplomatically complain <laughs> to many of the organizations, organizers that, you know, you're talking about these countries um, where they're making particular things and what they need to do, but I don't ever see the representations of these countries, you know, being on the stage. And most of these countries are with people who are brown and black, and I'm not seeing them being represented. You're talking about India's textile industry, where are Indian representatives from these factories. And just to add as well, um, let's not forget, as we're talking about, you know, the issues, fashion industry is one of the most complex, the fashion and textile industry, you have to remember that it's, it's, it's all, it's a big ecosystem. And it's one of the most complex systems out there. It, it includes agriculture, and that's a whole nother, nother story. And, you know, it calls it, you know, um, industrialization as well. So it's all of these and now it's even going into these new tech as well and digitization and um, AI, VR and all of these things are you know, affecting the textile industry or the fashion industry. So all of these areas, there's so many elements that need to be governed, you know, like uh, Tamisha was saying, there's so many elements of this industry. And so you may get it right, you may get it right in the fashion supply chain but then from the start of that supply chain through the agriculture side of it, you may be getting it completely wrong. And, you know, from your farming, um, working with the farmers um, through to the, the manufacturing, through to the retail, through to the impact on um, the environment from that point of view of the shipping and the, you know, getting things from A to B. There's going to be there's so much areas that sometimes it can feel like well what what can we do really what can we do um, I'm in groups where people are talking you know with um, ethical fashion experts and sometimes I read the posts I read the comments and you just feel like damn that's bad too <laughs> and that's bad too you're like yeah yeah bamboo no that's bad yeah yeah this and no that's bad but 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 you know oh vegan leather oh no that's bad. Because when you look into things so deeply, you realize it's really a messed up system. And that's what I'm saying that, you know, we're trying to fix something that is completely broken. It's like a whole new system needs to come in place. And how? This is what we're all trying to build, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, and I'm glad you glad you brought that up. And we'll, we will definitely go into that in a minute. But I do want to ask another Can I ask one more thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sure so I think the, the real elf in the room and the thing that we haven't said and all the things that we were describing are really just, we want to really just keep it funky, it, it's racial capitalism. And so, like, it, it's not going to be able to, we're going to keep producing these things because that's how this particular system has to operate, right? So I think that's important for anything else we're going to say in terms of what solutions are, are available to. Yeah, thank you, Misha, because that's where I was getting at. So I was going to ask, um, so why do we, why do these fashion companies only look at profit and not people, right? Or the environment, right? They only care about profit. Um, why do they only, they only have, and this is statistically, you know, correct that they only have white males at the top versus black and brown people integrated into their into the system. And I think you're absolutely correct, um, Misha, that is, it's, you know, because of racial capitalism, it's because of the broken 
uh, capitalism that is represented now that's only focused on profit, not focused on what happens across the globe or what happens in the environment. Um, and then it's also, you know, white supremacy, right? Because why wouldn't you hire something? It's statistically proven that if you have a diverse um, organization, like you're going to increase profits, you know? And so why wouldn't you do that? And I think it that I, I absolutely think that that's the root cause. So if anyone didn't realize, you know, when you're looking for the root cause, you go into why, why, why? You keep asking, why does this happen? Why is this? Why is this? And that's how you get to it. And so that's really the issue that we're, we're trying to solve for. Um, so I would like to go, I know we talked about it a bit and Jacqueline, you started to go into it. Let's talk about um, some of the solutions, right? So let's talk about, so in, in systems change, you're transitioning, some people are gonna be transitioning to a new system, right? They're gonna be using like the circular um, things that are going on with fashion, the tech and things like that. Like, so I would love to ask how our current um, organizations, because now that they realize they need to be more sustainable, more ethical, what are current, how are current business models changing to be more sustainable and more ethical? And then we'll talk about what that new building, that new system looks like. But um, Maybe Bettina, you can go into some of the, you know, circularity, uh, like circular fashion and what's going I, on. I literally was just going to 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 say, um, we didn't mention circular economy, but for me, it's a problem of not circular economy itself. I think it's wonderful. I think it's the concept of finding um, things that reuse for things that are discarded, maybe a scrap of fabric, maybe fabric that wasn't selected, uh, maybe processes of using orange peels or uh, food waste and production. All of those things are, I think, things that uh, communities of color and indigenous communities have been doing forever, but there's been such a marked uh, distaste for newness or having something that is new and secondhand is considered, um, it still took until now, uh, I think for us to really start embracing what I think a lot of communities of limited resources have always known that you don't need to make something new. Um, and so that new business model, we're seeing um, millions being spent on developing platforms um, that uh, one show maybe the pathway from the life cycle of a, a garment. And then two also just even look at ThreadUp who just went public with their of uh, their offering and they said, look, you know, we're, we have this marketplace where you can buy pre-owned clothing and that's a good thing. You're helping the environment, you're giving the clothing a longer life cycle and this is something that we need to do. I just think that we should have been listening and that kind of brings back to my pr point previously, which is we should have had some leadership in and areas where it, it reflected diverse leadership and we could have said, hey, we've known about this. We know that if you rewear something 20 times, 30 times, 100 times, don't shame someone for wearing something over again, celebrate them, make it okay to repair something. Um, and those right to repair and all those other things that come with secondhand and and loving what you already have is, is starting to spring up more and more across more spaces, not just small brands that, that, that are in, in kind of a niche corner. Absolutely. So in the case of um, thread up and going public, they're still, it kind of makes me cringe just a little bit. Um, not in any, I think the ideal of it is great. Mm -hmm. um, but they're still exporting the clothes that they don't sell in their marketplace still get sent to Ghana, right? And so then you have um, Kyogi and Ghana and like other market women and people who sell secondhand, they're still being impacted by the fashion industry and they're not getting any kind of, none of that capital that's being invested into thread up is being put on this other side of the value chain, right? Like it's not, uh, the value chain is secondhand. It's still not, 
it's not equitable, right? It's still, I think it's very like surface level and it's still putting capital above people and planet, right? So I think we need more of them, but, I, but again, I think there has to be like people in, in these places have already been recycling, reselling and everything else. So what kind of investment are you making in their industry when they can't sell, where does that, where does that waste go, right? Like their their infrastructure, their waste infrastructure is also not being developed. So what are we doing with it? So I, I don't think that completes the circle. Yeah, I think that that's such a good point. Um, so we have we have all these things, and and I apologize because we're you know running short on time. Um, so we could we could talk about so this so much. Um, but we do have all these things like recycle, reuse. Um, the circular economy and all these different business models that people are evolving to, but it does kind of, you know, you know, if we're trying to get somewhere in less than 10 years, like it's not necessarily enough, like this is good, but it's not necessarily enough. So I would love to uh, move to creating a new system. And, and what happens is that people will start to if we had a system in place, if we had you know people along the value chain, and and we had this new system, people will start to navigate toward that system. Um, so I would love to go into that. But before I do, I would love uh, Misha to talk a little bit about transparency and blockchain and and what you are doing, kind of like a a high level of how people are using that uh, to have a a better supply chain. So one of the things, as I mentioned, I'm starting, you know, as a B2B platform and we have an ethical sourcing marketplace. So one thing we allow or that we're doing in our platform, we're using blockchain in two ways. So sorry if you hear my little cousin <laughs> screaming, but <laughs> one of the ways that we do that is through um, basically providing or like making a passport for the item. So you will know that this raw material, so let's use a, the example of elephant grass from Northern Ghana and Bogotanga. So you'll know that Auntie Asat to pick this grass from this particular place, it was dyed by using these materials here. It was woven by this particular cooperative, this at this person, this person at this cooperative, it was shipped to Accra and then shipped to Colorado or wherever the basket is going. And then, um, the brand owner can then decide to take that information. They're able to see that on our platform and then they're able to take that information and put that in their product descriptions. They can put that on their product label pretty soon. Um, we're looking at some ways to um, have it to where you can scan, your, use your phone to scan so the consumer can also see, can actually hear from the artisan about how the product was made. Um, another thing that we are working on um, in terms of like, um, equity and more transparency is really trying to do away with um, at, at our heart is that the, the key goal will be to get rid of uh, piece rate mills. Um, no, <laughs> piece rate, um, piece, the, so piece rate, if you're not familiar, is just where an artisan might work six days and they only get paid $2 for the one thing they made because that's the value they're getting paid per piece. And so in order to, to overcome that, what we're doing is actually allowing the artisans to set their rate. Um, they set the rate. We don't do, there's no, no piece rate. So it's per hour, whatever, whatever way that they would like to be paid for it. We're doing some upskilling around product development and pricing strategy. Um, and then we have smart contracts. So a lot of times artisans are forced to take um, certain prices because they, you know, they aren't able to go buy the raw material to produce and then they can't, if they don't produce, they can't sell. And so one of the things we're offering is um, smart contracts. So basically that would allow the artisans to get a purchase order. So it's on demand production versus have to produce all of these things. So the retailer places an order, the artisan can, um, they, it shops through the marketplace. So the markets that we have some machine learning that will say, okay, this is the artisan group that best matches this retailer's desires. And then the, the artisans can decide, hey, do, they, do I wanna take in this purchase order? If I do, I can then, um, you know, I can get purchase order financing. So there's no need to wait for uh, the, the net 60 or net 90 day terms. Uh, but there, there's a lot more complication around that. 
Yeah, so I love it that you're using technology um, to, to have a more ethical and sustainable uh, value chain. So um, last question that I'm gonna ask, and this, this may require longer answers, but I would love, and hopefully this will cover some of the questions in the, in the chat too, is that let's talk about what that new system looks like. And I know that each of you are kind of doing work toward that new system, that instead of having a system, as Misha put it, that's, that's racial, that's built on like racial capitalism, instead of having that system, how would a new system look? And maybe some of the things that you're doing to help build that system. How would we work with govern government? How would we kind of either let, you know, somewhat level the playing field where we have these uh, black and brown makers that are getting as much income as, you know, someone in the global north? Like, what is that new system, that new connected ecosystem value chain? What does that look like? What are some of the things that we're doing now or that we should do in the future um, to start to create that new system? So I think one of the things would be, um, I know the fashion industry right now is lobbying. I'm speaking specifically of North America, but um, and specifically the US, but the US is um, a lot of the fashion industry or not a lot, but I'm going to say advocates are um, asking for or lobbying for a fashion czar to be put in place. So someone who is in the top levels of administration and asking for, you know, there to be more regulation and more oversight. So I think um, one of the key things, I think a lot of things we're saying are like, they consider, they're making consumers feel like they're consumers rather than citizens. And when you're a consumer, the only thing you can do is consume. But when you're a citizen, you can lobby. So I think that's one thing. I think it's also incentivizing brands and businesses to actually do right by people on the planet, right? They're incentivized to, to not do well. <laughs> there's all these, you know, there's cuts for, you know, if you, I don't know, there's just, I feel like there's um, a lot of incentives to, I guess, de-incentivize producing in a way that's extractive and incentivize, um, producing a way that benefits people and planet. And again, I think, and that's in terms of North America, but on the ground in a lot of the producer company uh, countries, I think as, as it starts to shift out on this side, I think it's really building their industries around the, the producers, whether those are artisans or garment workers or whatever, whatever it is, I think having more unions um, and again, having collective bargaining agreements and um, more around that. I think that's all fantastic. And uh, fashions are um, just to be in place at a government level. But even in the case of globally, we need to get more granular. I think I've seen where um, there's been a push to remove tags from care tags from garments. And that's something as simple as that then you take away the educational piece of for someone to know how to care for their garment. And if they don't know how to take care of it, then it's likely that it could be thrown away quicker. So just that mindset of thinking, how do we empower people as Samisha was saying of just not being a consumer, but actually a partner in caring for their clothes, um, caring for the people who made them and actually looking at their clothes as something that's an extension of them. So it's the back to that cultural piece again and it, that reflection of their identity. If you think of your clothing like that, you can't go backwards and then say, oh, well, it's just something that I'm just throwing on and I'll throw it away. I mean, if you change that relationship, then that can help your mindset shift and um, we're starting to see that, but that new system of, of accountability and transparency, it also has to reach backwards and account for the millions of things that are in landfill and piling up and just people's hearts and minds. So it's not only a shift of regulation and government to, um, to not produce and find out ways that we can measure something besides gross domestic product. 
how do we do well-being and i know there's happiness studies and other things like that but if you're just trying to survive how do you have time to to think about what's possible and, and happiness and if you're you know at the bottom of a supply chain or any value chain um are, is your happiness a, a, a desire of someone at the top of it um the, those are those social uh ills that are difficult to answer but they're starting to happen and they just have to not happen only at small brands but bigger ones as well individual contributors and and those with some some uh, clout and frankly money to to throw at these things to to support uh, those types of initiatives. Right. Um, Jacqueline, did you have? Yeah, I'm going to keep it really short. I know time is short. Um, I think amazing points both ladies have shared um, on this. And um, just to add to it, I'll come from the perspective of um, the creator, the designer. I'm, I put a lot of responsibility on that person as well because it's coming from the mind and it's put, being put out. And from working um, in Israel, I was a sustainability ambassador for both, uh, both Puma and um, CNA. And within that, you know, dissipated knowledge from the sustainable fashion industry through to the designers, it was, you know, it was highly recognized that many of the designers don't have that understanding. They're just told from their buyers, their product managers, you know, we need to make, you know, I did swimwear, so we're like, okay, we need to have 100 styles this season, we're going to do 10, which covered, you know, last year, we're going to do blah, 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 blah. But then there wasn't really that big story within about sustainable, and that, um, the sustainable edge or circular fashion, whatever. And I think if we're taught as designers, or, you know, we, we start to think about designing with the end in mind, you know, rather than trying to be reactive to a problem, how about we start from the beginning and be proactive from the, from the conception to make it created with the end in mind with the use, et cetera, et cetera, and how it will, you know, go back into the earth or not, or if it doesn't. So um, I just want to add on that, but that's how I would see part of the changes that there will be more knowledge information for the design teams to design with the end in mind. So yeah, I think that goes into um, education too. And so I think another thing I would like to see it's people saying, okay, these are the best raw materials that we have to use this. These are the best for the planet. These are the best for people. And then designing within that limitation versus let's, you know, create things that, I don't know, are just out of this world that don't really need to happen. So like if we have hemp, right? Let's say we have hemp material, it can be dyed these colors. What can we do to innovate with what we have versus extracting? Right, or what can be returned and what can be regenerative. But I think that also, again, happens with, like Jacqueline was saying, with the design education so from the student level as well. Yeah, and so thank you. Uh, we have like a minute-ish left. Um, so I would just like to thank all of our uh, speakers, but then also, so within Catalyst 2030, we are starting a working group. So all of your questions in the chat are amazing. All of your comments, everything that's like resources, like we're going to start a working group and I'll put the information in the chat because you can actually email Deepa if you're interested, if you're interested in this topic, which obviously you are because you're here. And if you want to come up, help come up with a solution to actually make an impact um, by 2030, then I would love for all of you to reach out to Deepa and join the working group. We'll actually, you know, hopefully we can have some of the speakers back and talk more about these solutions because I know each of you are working on different projects. Um, but in this working group, we will talk about, hey, this is what the issue is. We will gather people together that are coming up with these solutions and we will go out and we'll, you know, implement and do different things to actually move this forward. And I love this because we also tackled a lot of the social issues um, and, and talked about, you know, what can we do in the future. So please reach out to Deepa and um, sign up for that working group. And we'll talk a lot more about this and a lot more of the answers to your questions. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Misha. Thank you, Bettina. This was an amazing session and I loved um, hearing those points of views from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank y'all for listening.